So the format tonight is Ignite. Ignite was created by uh, Brady Forrest at O'Reilly, and it, the, it's loosely modeled on, I guess, Pecha Kucha, if you're familiar with that format. So speakers have five minutes. Not any five minutes, however, free to do with as they will. Oh, no. These five minutes are definitely structured. They have 20 slides. Each slide automatically, or manually in the case of uh, one presentation tonight, forwards after 15 seconds. This forces them to be prompt. This forces them to have rehearsed, one hopes. This forces them to be interesting and fast and all those good things that make for a fun night. Halfway through, after the fourth speaker, we will present the Google O'Reilly Open Source Awards, and then we will continue and end with the same uh, star that we have ended every Tuesday night with, I think bar one, the lovely Damien Conway. And if you think he can do his talk in five minutes, you are a person of stronger faith than I. But <laughs> That's the plan. We will try. So the first speaker tonight will be known to you from his frequent OzCon appearances. Now, he's uh, the man behind RT, the request tracker. And he's also the man behind uh, distributed source control system and many other interesting tools, which we decided not to ask him to speak about. Instead, he is going to tell you about something which he assures me is of the utmost legality, but is nonetheless very interesting. So could you please welcome on stage to talk about his work with the Kindle and open source, the ever interesting Jesse Vincent. <clears throat> Can we have presentation one, please? Right. Your that, time uh, starts now. Oh, great. Hi, I'm Jesse, and I'm a recovering sysadmin. Um, I keep buying these devices, finding out they use Linux, and losing a month of my life. This Kindle here, to some of you have them. Um, is anyone from Amazon here this evening? This is a Linux box, a $300 Linux box, with an ARM CPU, a evil Java GUI, and a really nice hackable user land. Um, it is important that you don't do some evil things. Amazon gives you free 3G. Don't use it to tether your laptop. Don't hack their, uh, their Topaz DRM because it'll piss off the publishers. And don't hack the Moby Pocket DRM because it's been done six times. Um, it's important to know this has a GPS in it. Amazon knows where you are. They know where oh. you live. They, know, they have your credit card number. And the syslogs from this thing get sent up to Amazon a couple times a day. If you decide to play with the Kindle, there's lots of fun you can do. Um, the Kindle doesn't read the ebook formats I like, and that makes me sad. Um, it doesn't read lit or EPUB or PDF. Um, and I bought it and couldn't read a lot of books that I like. So I started looking around, well, what can I do? Um, actually, all these formats are well documented. Conversion is no problem. And so the first thing I did is, well, I figured I can probably hack something up with a web server and use the Kindle's web browser, and I ended up with this nice little pro proxy. Um, and that's out of order. So Caliber is an open source e um, document conversion tool and GUI and all this other good stuff. And it's a desktop app. It's giant and huge and kind of painful when you want to have this nice little thing. So that first proxy I built allows you to go to a URL and it'll magically transform a document into something that Kindle can read. An EPUB or a PDF becomes a zip comic book or a PRC, a Moby Pocket book. And that worked for a while. Um, Use the mic, Jesse. So sorry. Um, and then I found that the Kindle had a USB network mode. The USB port can be an Ethernet port if you enter some arcane commands. And then I could ping it. And then it started to get fun. Because there's this guy who went and poked around at, um, well, the Kindle update format is a tarball. And it's well understood. And the Kindle 1 update format, well, it didn't change for the Kindle 2. So it's really easy to build software updates. Maybe a software update that has something like BusyBox and TelnetD and init script. And when I logged in, I found it's really a nice Linux. Proc config GZ is there, so you can recompile the kernel. They even left in the <laughs> NFS file system, so you can mount a real file system and get some work done. Um, 
and then I needed to build software. And I tried QMU, uh, I tried cross-compiling, but the easiest thing turned out to be a Nokia internet tablet where you could apt get install GCC. And then I had screen, I had NFS mount, I went to town. Um, I built Caliber. It took about three days to build QT on an N810. Um, and then once I got it working, I discovered that it took, oh, well, half day to convert one book because, Kindle, uh, because Caliber has a lovely CSS engine, which I replaced with a regex. Um, and then it was pretty easy to build a, a XPDF or Poplar-based PDF to comic book zip uh, converter. It's just pings in a zip file. Um, and you can use iBus or, or iNotify or DBus to notify the system when someone's added a file. It just worked. And then my friends started getting DXs. And they had a real PDF reader. I mean, it didn't have Zoom. It didn't have indexes. And it, well, actually kind of sucked. But it got me interested again. And I figured, well, if I can figure out how to drive the screen, and if I can figure out how to drive the keyboard, that's easy. PDF reader, no problem. Um, it turns out that the keyboard is a Linux keyboard. The mouse is a Linux keyboard. The display is a Linux frame buffer. And all this stuff comes out of the GPL kernel source code that everyone said, well, Amazon didn't release anything useful. Actually, they did. Um, you call a couple of ioctals and you get the display updating. And now you have a kind of working machine. And I figured, well, that was easy. Maybe I can, well, I tarred up a copy of Ubuntu for ARM. I copied it to the Kindle. And I typed Chroot. And then I had Ubuntu on my Kindle. But Kubuntu is taken, so I need some other name for it. Um, I tried starting up X and discovered that X needs a TTY for no particularly good reason. So I added a couple of return one statements, and then X worked fine. Um, so at this point, I have a working Ubuntu Chroot on a Kindle. X works. Froths is quite nice. NetHack plays just fine. Um, MPlayer is still a bit of a problem. But if you're interested in hacking on the Kindle, come find me later. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jesse. Well done. Keep to the five minutes. I don't have a gong. I feel naked. I can't uh, ring you off the stage if you go over. Uh, actually, you didn't hear that, future speakers. You didn't hear that. So our next speaker is um, a wonderful person, despite coming from Australia. And she's overcome this enormous obstacle in her life to, uh, no, not really, hasn't overcome that ob enormous obstacle. It's, it remains with her to the day, as you'll tell from her accent, uh, to uh, do, do interesting work with Pearl, to head off to Vanuatu just because she could, and uh, get those geeks set up and, and running. Done all sorts of interesting things in her life, which, once again, we didn't ask her to talk about. So instead, here to talk about textiles is the lovely Scud. OK, I'm going to start early. <laughs> um, I've been at the Community Leadership Summit all weekend, and it's now t This is not the first slide. Can we actually go back to the first slide? Because this is like the 10th. No, nope, not even close. And they're out of order. What's going on? Thank you. OK. It's Tuesday of OSCON, and I'm already totally exhausted. And I said to Nat, I'm only going to talk at Ignite if I can talk about something that is not technology and it is not geeky. And I thought, I'm going to talk about one of my non-geeky hobbies, one of the hobbies I use to get away from geekiness. And then I realized I'm kind of geeky anyway about that. So here are five geeky things you can do with textiles. First one is you can set them on fire. And why would you do that? Uh, because setting textiles on fire tells you what they are. It's called the burn test. You take a, an unknown textile, you burn it, and the smell of it tells tells you what it is. If it smells like burning hair, it's probably an animal-based fibre. So something like wool or alpaca or angora or cashmere or silk, which is an animal-based fibre because uh, silkworms poop silk. Um, if you set fire to your textile and it smells like burning paper, it's probably a plant-based fibre. Um, cotton and linen are two you're probably aware of. Bamboo is very trendy at the moment, as is modal, which comes from uh, ground-up beech trees. Um, also, man-made cellulosic fibres like uh, rayon and viscose are all... Uh, they smell like paper when you burn them. This is what happens if you burn synthetic fabrics. This is why you do not wish to burn, why you do not wish to wear synthetic fabrics, especially not in the kitchen, and especially not on your small children around the campfire. Because if that stuff burns, it sticks to your skin, and the people in ER have to pick it out. 
So the second geeky thing you can do with textiles is you can look really closely at them. This is how you tell one animal fibre from another or one plant fibre from another. Um, ideally, you would use an electron microscope for this. Um, here are some pictures I made earlier, or you know, found on Google Images. Uh, the first one is cotton, the second one is merino. What you'll notice about the merino wool there is that it has funny sort of scales. And what that means, I don't know if any of you ever put a sweater in the washing machine and it all like shrunk and felted together. It's the scales that do that. Here are some people doing it on purpose. Um, they're actually like getting in there and scrunching the wool and, and felting it intentionally because they used to think that was a really good thing to do. Um, they used to make machines to do this. The next slide shows a 17th century water-powered fulling mill. Um, but these days we much prefer to not have our wool felt. So in order to make wool not felt, we do something called a superwash process, which uses like a, a horrible toxic chlorine bath and then uh, coats all of those little scales with resin. Um, and that makes it washable. So the the third thing you can do with textiles is you can use them to invent lolcats. And you're probably wondering uh, how this works. So textiles used to be very, very boring. Um, there were very simple weaves, like uh, on the left here is what's called a tabby weave, and on the right is a twill weave. You're probably wearing jeans made out of it. They're really dull. And to have something more interesting, it takes a lot of uh, time and effort. You have to painstakingly you know, do stuff, unless you can automate this in some fashion. And so there was a guy called uh, Monsieur Jacquard, who you've probably all heard of, and he invented a thing called the Jacquard loom, which led inexorably uh, and unavoidably to the internet and uh, lolcats, or as in this case, lolpackers. So you can blame textile geeks for that. The fourth thing you can do with textiles is spread free culture. I don't know if you know, but um, textiles used to suffer from vendor lock-in. In the Middle Ages, if you wanted to buy a pair of, say, uh, knitted stockings or gloves, the only place to get them from was a medieval guild of knitters who had these trade secrets and they would not tell anyone else unless they were a member of the guild. Um, and I'm deadly serious about this, right? This went on for hundreds of years. And then, you know, things go in cycles and there was sort of a democratisation. So this is the 18th century um, open textiles movement. And uh, these guys are just sitting in the street knitting socks and there's sort of a cottage industry going on there. It's kind of like Etsy, but uh, 200 years ago. But as I said, it goes through cycles and uh, the 20th century was a serious low point. Um, these pattern companies would sell you these patterns, but only if uh, you would use their yarn and their tools and follow their pattern exactly. It's kind of like the Kindle. Um, and that's not real cool. So these days, luckily, there's a whole free culture movement going on around textiles. Websites like Craft Magazine, Ravelry, Nitty, uh, Instructables can tell you how to do all sorts of cool textile stuff that you know previously used to be kind of secret or expensive to find out about. And so the obviously fifth geeky thing you can do with textiles is make things. Um, I thought, you know, textiles, it's kind of like a soft woo-woo girly sort of thing. No, like there's so much math in it, there's so much geometry, there's all sorts of complicated stuff, and people make geeky shit out of textiles. Look at this, people are making TARDIS hats and, and an entire model of uh, the human brain crocheted out of yarn. Um, that's in a neuroscience museum, by the way. Um, so I would say, like, I encourage you all to make geeky things out of textiles. This is a coral reef crocheted out of textiles. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, see me later. Very nice. I love the, the crocheted brain, all the riffly bits. So that's the cortex. I learned recently that, side trivia for you, um, cortex comes from the Latin for bark because it's the outside of the brain and it's all roughly and crinkly and obviously that's what they thought of when they saw it. You know, brains metaphors travel with the the uh, fads of technology. So in the old days, um, yeah, the old days, uh, a brain was a machine. Uh, these days, the brain as a computer. And obviously, they, they went through a phase of thinking of the brain as a tree. Um, you, you work with what you've got. So our, our next speaker is going to talk to you about the future. And the future is a subject near and dear to my heart because, uh, well, every second that goes by, I get closer to it. I certainly hope to have one. And I certainly hope it has a jetpack, but more importantly, I hope that it has the interesting and exciting things that the lovely Liz Henry will be here to tell us about. Now, can you please make welcome Liz Henry? Fantastic. 
Let's remember to leave the microphone on when we're done. This will be yours. Oh, fantastic. Oh my God, and that shaggy man carrying the, uh, hey. the, the, the wheelchair, who is not on stage and is absolutely not speaking, is the, uh, the lovely Danny O'Brien. Work for it. <laughs> Didn't recognize him because he looked like a Yeti. All right, thank you. Once again, Henry. Sorry. They want to bring out over here. Hi, I'm Whoa. Hi, I'm Liz Henry. Would you like a flying jetpack? I really, really, really would. <laughs> to get them, we're going to need to apply DIY and open source ideas and organization to hack accessibility and the idea of disability. My wheelchair is a machine. It's just a tool to get my body from one place to another. I'd like for it to be easy and possible for me to fix and hack, like a bike or a car. It's really no more complex. I, basically, I want root on my own mobility. You can easily find information on how to fix a car, even though a car is like a giant polluting killing machine. There are books, tools, and manuals available. The barriers to entry are low, so a lot of people start car fixing bus bus businesses. There's a whole industry around car fixing. You can find out how to fix a bike. There's tons of information freely circulated to the public. There's 20 million bike riders in the US, and there's little independent bike shops to support them everywhere. So that's a whole industry, too, based on open information. However, to fix a wheelchair, you can't find out. 55 million disabled people are not feeling lucky. <laughs> it's very hard to find information on how to fix a wheelchair or build one, how to sew your own seat back, build lightweight, interchangeable parts. Just no, not happening. Um, oddly, rather than being a tool like a bike or a car, a wheelchair, walker, or even a cane is considered a medical device. Its invention, distribution, and maintenance are all under the control of powerful elites, like your friendly doctor. Why should you care? Well, because you will likely be disabled or have significant physical impairment for around eight years of your life. That's the average in industrialized countries. No amount of individual power changes the systemic problems disabled people face. How can you avoid this fate? Dick Cheney, one of the most powerful people on the planet, threw out his back and ended up in the worst vehicle ever. 50 pounds of cold steel, might as well be a wheelbarrow. You can't get around in that. Bang, he's lost his independent agency. It's not all about wheelchairs, though. As coders, you might think about hand functionality, dexterity. You could lose that. People invent stuff to help with it. Most of that info is out, in, out of print books and on a couple of personal blogs. And that can vanish into the mist like GeoCities pages. Why should you care now? Until you need it, you really don't care. When you do need it, you're busy, you're poor, and you're in pain, usually. No telomere fixing nanobot is gonna save you from age and impairment. In fact, impossible utopian nanobots are probably why we don't have our jetpacks now. Why isn't disability hacking more popular? Two big reasons, attitude and socioeconomic factors. Bad attitudes are fear of mortality, medical experts, expectation of charity, isolation, lack of information sharing, the second factor is systemic and socioeconomic. Your impaired body makes you disabled, so you fall under the control of the medical industrial complex. Your wheelchair repair manual or voice, voice control hack might get you sued, might violate copyright or a patent, might ruin someone's profit, someone else's profit. At some point, you will need assistive technology, and you will want to hack it. You'll need a DIY attitude about access. You'll really, really need open source information structures and communities. You'll need big projects and the ability to customize things individually. Here's some cool DIY hacks. Uh, bicycle crutch holders made from PVC pipe. I can ride a bike, I just can't walk too well most of the time. Soda bottle, bottle prosthetic arms, very cheap to make, um, but they work. Crutch pockets help you carry things when your hands are full. 
This is a great project. You could join Tactile Maps. It's a brilliant mashup for people with visual impairments. Um, you email them an address, and they print and snail mail you a raised print map. Um, this has software and hardware people collaborating very closely, and a lot of different people are trying different ways to approach that problem. Um, another one, OneSwitch.org, is a brilliant collection of hacks with step-by-step -step instructions on building OneSwitch interfaces to electronic devices. Uh, you can control something with one finger, play games um, just by puffing air through a tube. Um, that's another really great one. Uh, people with disabilities need open source, soft, uh, open source software people and structure, um, but I believe that existing open source projects also need the physical inventiveness and software adaptations driven by necessity made by people with disabilities. Everyone disabled has a cool hack or two. They have to. In the future, will you be this sad, lonely guy fumbling to epoxy tennis balls onto the feet of your totally World War II-looking hospital walker? The recipient of charity, pity, mass-produced help at the mercy of what elite experts think is good for you? Or will you be hacking your way in your Burning Man jetpack as part of a vibrant community that supports serendipity, free access to information, non-hierarchical peer relationships, and a culture of invention? That's what I hope for. What will our future be? A DIY approach to hacking ability and disability will help everyone. We'll invent cool shit. We'll open source open sourcely collaborate our way out of nursing home prisons run by the evil medical industrial complex, and the future will be awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. I want my, still want my jetpack, but it will have crutch holders. Yeah. Perfect. Hovercraft. And a hovercraft? Oh, man, I want your future. Your future rocks. So those of you who have been here for several years will have probably met or at least seen in the hallway at some time this wonderful man. I recently came to the conclusion that life was too short to work with assholes, which makes me very proud and very happy to work with this lovely, friendly guy. Um, Julian Cash, the man behind Super Snail and the many photos of open source people that he will talk about tonight. Please make Julian welcome. Your microphone's up on the stage. Testing. Cool. Hi, my name is Julian. I'd like to show you some photos I've taken. These are pictures I took at OSCON around the turn of the millennium, once upon a time when I was doing a lot of web Perl programming, which I'm still doing. Um, Nat Torkington ran the convention that year, and he asked if I would come back next year and take more photos. I thought it was a great idea, but really wanted to be able to set up a white background portrait studio. He had faith in me and made it so I got the space that I asked for. This is part of one of the super, this is one of the superpowers of open source, that they make leaps of faith like this. <clears throat> this is Jeff Bates, who's one of the creators of Slashdot, and he's typing on a keyboard made by Sandwich Girl, which she painted while she was at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. <clears throat> Larry Wall wrote Pearl. His family is one of the most warm, loving, creative, inspirational, fun, genius families I've ever known. <clears throat> if you enjoy OSCON this year, Alison Randall is at least partly to blame. When I first met her, I wondered if she was related to Randall Schwartz. <laughs> when Dan Sigowski and friends were writing Parrot, they ran into a serious financial crisis. If any of you can relate, give a wave. We live in exciting times. So there's a few possible ways you can, approaches you can look at the economic and financial crisis that we're facing. One possibility is to say what? Everything is fine. But business as usual is unlikely to give the results that we truly want. The alternative is answers. Where are the answers going to come from? You. The people in this room, the people in this convention are, have, are the best people to have the smarts and 
the imagination to solve the problems, or you can leave it up to MCI WorldCom. I love his t-shirt. This is Blaine Cook, who's architect, he architected Twitter, and he also helped bring the world OAuth, which makes the web far more connected than it would be otherwise. Brad Fitzpatrick is a scuba diver, but he also gave the world LiveJournal, Google Social Graph API, Memcached, and a bunch of other Perl programs that basically make the web function. O'Reilly books and conventions spread knowledge. They create an environment and a culture of collaboration and optimism. This is what we need. Oh, this is the old version of the slide, of the slideshow. Uh, Brian Aker, Brian Aker uh, helped bring the world drizzle making it so that MySQL technology stays free and open source despite the current business and political climate. David Axmark and Monty and friends brought the world MySQL, making, proving that an open source business model could be truly viable. This is James Duncan Davidson, who's taken most of the good O'Reilly Convention photos for the last several years. I thought they were a couple when I asked them to pose. This is Terry Gross of Fresh Air. Discussion, debate is part of what we truly need. Also, we need to face our demons. This is Debbie Harry of Blondie. Music, creativity, self-expression, photography is part of what we need. I brought a rocket launcher and a dozen kittens to this shoot. Kelsey is one of my best friends. The speculum guns are great, but it's the tampon bullets that really bring it home. <laughs> my family and friends are mostly artists. This community has some issues that they're facing, and I believe that I have the answers to those problems. If you're a geek and code and have an interest, Say hi to me afterwards, or take a look at creative.ly. Um, figure out your cause, work hard, save the world. Our next speaker is an expert at doing things on the cheap. She helped bootstrap the server infrastructure for a major messaging company, Mebo on the smell of an oily rag. And here, to show us how to make your own oily rag smells, I would like to welcome the one and only Sandy Jen. Sandy, please come up. And I need a handheld microphone. Beautiful, thank you. So I have to admit, I actually didn't rehearse, but I have a lot of pictures, so I'm hoping that'll help. So um, when we started Mebo uh, three and a half years ago, I didn't know much about open source, I have to admit. And our sort of foray into open source was kind of born from the fact that we had absolutely no money. And we heard that open source was cheap and free. We're like, great, that sounds awesome. So that's how we kind of got into open source. Um, has it been 15 seconds? <laughs> I guess not. So um, we, I put the, oh, there we go. Cheap and tasty. So when I define cheap, I don't necessarily mean, you know, don't spend any money at all. Um, cheap to me means, you know, making a wise decision about the money you have. But also cheap also means, you know, not spending, wasting the resources of your team members, not kind of, you know, going overboard. And so we started out with Apache. And I think kind of think of web servers as sort of your user's first blind date with your service. Because if it's a, through your first impression, you want to, you know, go well. And Apache didn't work out very well for us, unfortunately. And so we sort of jumped to using LightTBD. And LightTBD was written by a guy in Germany. We actually met him. He's a really nice guy. And like all Europeans, he turned our one-hour dinner into four-hour dinners. So that was kind of fun. Um, and after LightTBD, we kind of explored Nginx. And this is where we're kind of at today. And I think um, Nginx is a really interesting way 
um, to demonstrate sort of the evolution of web servers. And from Apache, which is still, I think, the number one web server out there, um, to Nginx, um, my server dev actually wanted me to put this picture on there because Nginx is not vulnerable to the slow Loris attack. Um, and he really liked that picture, so there you go. Um, so Nginx, for us, is also an interesting way of sort of figuring out where we are, how far we've come from sort of the first days of uh, open source, and this is going kind of fast. So load balancers are very expensive, and this guy obviously can show that. Um, and um, for us, load balancers, you know, the, the problem with load balancers is you can't just buy one, you have to buy two. And when you buy a lot of them, you have to buy them in pairs. And load balancers usually cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And so we actually experimented with this thing called HA proxy. Um, and it's worked out really well. And the thing with, um, you know, HA proxy is that they're just instances. You can run them anywhere. And um, we named them Justin and Kelly so that when we have problems with them, you can actually, you know, have a chuckle. So uh, when you do that, you know, it's fun. And so when we yeah, looked at databases, um, MySQL was obviously the sort of the standard again, like Apache. And uh, my devs kind of described MySQL as kind of like a lawyer. Whatever task you give it, it's the same price. And when you really need it, it's still real expensive. And so we actually tried looking at CouchDB, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. Um, it's worked out beautifully. Um, obviously, MySQL has its benefits. Um, so does Couch. But for us, the user, do uh, user data storage engine that we've used, um, Couch has been you know, awesome. And on to the last thing I was going to talk about, which is statistics. And every web service, every product out there these days wants analytics. You want to know how your service, how your service is doing. And writing you know, hundreds and lines of Python code is not fun. Um, and so uh, if any of you have gone to the recent Hadoop conference in uh, Santa Clara, we learned about Pig, which is sort of this platform written on top of Hadoop, um, which gives you sort of an execution engine and a query language that gives you a really, really nice way to batch process um, uh, data processing. Um, and so the last slide, I only actually have 15 slides, but the last thing I wanted to say was that even though you can be really cheap, people are totally worth the money. And I couldn't survive a day at Amoeba without the team that I have and cherish every single one of your friends and your team members and your fellow you know, open source geeks. Because I think they're, they're, they're totally worth the money. Thanks. Whoa. Thank you. It's lovely to meet someone who will actually admit to being cheap. That's fantastic. So our next speaker, how do I describe this? I'm an old, cynical bastard. Those of you who know me know this to be true. I have been bouncing around these internets for almost 20 years, which is a horrifying number to mention. <sighs> Paper bag, anyone? And in that time, I am not afraid to admit that I've become jaded and cynical. But this man's blog was the only thing last year that inspired me. And so I was so happy to ask him to come along because I hope that he'll be able to share with you some of the lessons that he has learned as a teacher that will perhaps enlighten uh, your work either with your children or with your coworkers if they have the intellect of children um, or perhaps with your coworkers even if they don't. Could you please make welcome, and dear God, I hope he's here. Oh, thank God he's standing up. There we go. Please make welcome the one and only Dan Mayer. <laughs> Lovely to meet you at last. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dan. This is my first OzCon, so holler. Um, I teach high school math for five years now, and uh, the first two of those were pretty miserable. This is a brief anecdote about misery. Um, it starts like this. You, you prep a lesson for three hours, and you spend a not insignificant amount of time uh, selecting an outfit that you feel like your students will respect you for. Um, and you get to school, and within five minutes, you have 10 students around you, all of whom have noticed uh, what you haven't, that you are wearing uh, one navy blue sock and one royal blue sock. Shame on you. And this kind of uh, insecurity persists for two years until you realize that navy blue, royal blue, matching, unmatching, uh, ribbed or unribbed, you are not your socks. That's a really great moment. Um, and you also realize that um, 
that other people spend hundreds of couch hours and thousands of dollars chasing down the same profound sense of self that you got from teaching fractions to freshmen for two years, which is great. And what else is great is that any good thing your students do uh, ever in life or become, that's you. You did that. Even if we're just talking about some poet laureate who hated your math class, uh, that's on your cosmic tab. Good job. Um, obviously and unfortunately this goes in both directions where uh, whatever awful things your students do or become later on in life, uh, you also own a stake in that. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, it gets even worse though uh, because I don't teach to create workers, I teach to create citizens, thoughtful people who approach life's great problems with a lot of humility and uh, clarity of thought. And I realize that while I do, I, I do a pretty good job teaching the math in five years, I do a really terrible job teaching the citizenry. Um, it's like this, David Milch, the, the showrunner of Deadwood, said this about the Iraq war, that Americans are impatient with irresolution, that we crave uh, sitcom-sized problems and uh, easy answers to them in 22 minutes and three acts and two commercial breaks. Uh, and the Iraq war isn't that. It, it was never going to be that. Um, and yet we've got politicians on both sides who are all too eager uh, to feed us whatever answers we are willing to buy. Uh, we get the politicians we deserve, I'm convinced. Uh, and so now I have to admit to my sorry role in this transaction where I prepare my students to accept those easy answers. Um, I, I make them comfortable um, with things that resolve easily. I've lost myself, excuse me, while I wait here. Uh, it goes like this. Um, I ask questions with only two answers, and I signal the answer to that question based on my facial expression, either positive or skeptical. Um, it, it's terrible, and students know how to game this system. Um, I, let me ask you this. Does the tone of my voice matter when I ask a question, or does the tone of my voice matter when I ask a question? Do you feel me? Um, so I had to train myself to always look skeptical all the time and to push past the answer as fast as possible uh, to the why of the answer, to the justification, because that's what the magic is. And my students hate it because they love the resolution, uh, but we're getting better at it. Um, another terrible thing I do is I ask really compelling, good questions, but I break it out into four steps, A, B, C, and D. And I'm basically just a uh, paving a nice path uh, from problem to solution and congratulating my students on how well they have stepped over some small cracks in the way. So this is everything I know about teaching in three words, good teaching, that's this, be less helpful. Uh, as, teachers, as teachers, we are helpful in all the wrong ways. We make all the wrong things too easy for our students. So I'm talking like this. Instead of uh, just give them the question and no information, make them tell you what information is important or, or throw tons of information at them and have them sift through all the garbage and find the gems. Uh, what was the last worthy problem you solved that, that gave you all the relevant information up front and accessible? It doesn't happen. Um, so I'm getting better and feeling encouraged. I use now uh, visuals, and I'll, I'll put up a clear visual with a simple question, and it unpacks into some huge, complicated mathematical proofs where we're all pulling down different answers, and it's all about the justification. It's all about getting comfortable with irresolution. It's awesome. I spent uh, 20 bucks and 30 minutes in a thrift shop uh, last week buying all kinds of glassware uh, because the question, how high will the soda go? That's like a month worth of calculus there. Um, and it's so cool and I'm so obsessed. And it's great because all of us teachers have, have cameras in our pockets uh, ready to go for this stuff. It's never been easier to create and capture it. Unfortunately, it's still very hard to share it. Even in an age of YouTube, Vimeo, and Flickr, there's no place for teachers to share audio, photo, video, and a lesson plan in a collaborative environment. And that's a shame especially because uh, the job is about to get a lot harder, um, especially here in California where we have no money. Um, the, the job is going to get 50% uh, harder in some cases, and it'd be nice to uh, offset that somehow. So that's why I'm here at my first OSCON. Um, I've got a domain name. Um, I've got uh, pages of user interface notes. I know what this needs to be, this portal for teachers. I have no idea how to make it. Um, I'm not trying to get paid off of this. I just want to open source my teaching and change how learners learn. Uh, so if you, if you feel like I feel, please get a hold of me um, and thank you for your five minutes. Thank you, Dan. You can't miss him because he's the one with the raised eyebrow. Now, our next speaker is going to tell us. Oh, geez, and I've drawn a complete bloody blank. 
This is absolutely appalling. I should never have left my notebook behind. So I apologize, and will you please make welcome for a completely mystery presentation, uh, Selena Dreckelman, wherever you might be. Yes, huzzah. I'll return to class. That was an awesome introduction. OK. So uh, I'm here to tell you about how a bunch of normal people used technology to repair a rigged election. So um, a couple months ago, a guy sent an email to the PostgreSQL hackers list and said, hey, anybody want to go to Nigeria? So I did. I went there for about 10 days. And I went to uh, Ondo State, which you can see right there. It was, it was pretty fun. It was a long car ride, four hours, potholes. And uh, once I got there, I met some pretty cool people. These are my students. Um, they were working on a database, or working on a database, um, to store census information and voter registration data. So I was there to tell them a little bit more about Postgres so that they could do that job. But while I was there, I learned a little bit about Nigerian politics. Um, I don't know about you, but I actually didn't know anything about Nigerian politics before I got there. So I distilled what I learned into six steps that I'm going to share with you. So first step, if you want to unrig an election, is that you need to actually run for political office. So you can see here the two guys that were running. That's Mimiko and Agugu. Agugu was the incumbent. Uh, Mimiko was running uh, for a very small party called the Labor Party, which actually didn't have any places uh, that they were in power anywhere in Nigeria. So on April 14th, uh, 2007, there was actually an election. Uh, and by all standards, international, local, people thought that it didn't go very well. Um, and over that next weekend, there were a lot of protests, there was violence, uh, people thought the elections were stolen. So anyway, uh, that was a problem. So as you might anticipate, uh, Mimiko lost. Uh, and so at that point, he had a choice. He had to decide, was he going to challenge uh, that that result, or was he going to let it stand as many people in the past had done? And he decided not to give up. So a month later, he and a group of uh, other, other people filed a protest um, with the Elections Commission. And uh, they, they had some information. They uh, had gone to the Elections Commission and collected a bunch of ballots. And the way that you vote in Nigeria is you get a paper ballot and you put your fingerprint next to the candidate that you would like to vote for. So they had all of these ballots and all of these fingerprints and they needed some technology. Um, to manage them. So he found a couple guys that knew a little bit about IT. This is uh, Cyril and Feng Xiu, who I spent quite a bit of time with when I was there. And they took all those ballots and they scanned them in. And then what they needed was an expert to look at those fingerprints. So they found this guy, Adrian Forty, who uh, lives in the UK, or lived in the UK. And he analyzed all of those ballots. And uh, they ended up looking at over 120,000 of these and they tried to find some patterns. And what they found was 84,814 of them were duplicates. In one case, one single fingerprint was on 360 individual ballots. So they had some evidence, and they had the court system, and then they needed to wait. So over the next two years, um, they went to court over and over again. They were cross-examined. Um, many members of the IT team that were involved uh, worked on it. And anyway, <laughs> it's coming to the end. Yes, in the end, they did actually win. Um, last February, February 23rd, they assumed power and started the work of cleaning up after the previous government. Um, Right there, that, I'm not gonna try to say that, but that's a uh, Yoruba saying that, that means left like thieves. Um, just as an example, some of the things the outgoing administration did, they cut up this railing at a UNESCO World Heritage Site just to make things hard for the incoming government. Um, the people that are uh, running this government now, they're full of hope. They really believe that IT um, can help bring uh, sunlight into their government, increase transparency, and they're working on a lot of really cool IT projects. They've got this one organization called SeatDeck. Um, 
and they're doing things like trying to bring text messaging uh, into government so that the people can contact their government directly. Um, and they're trying to bring like microwave links to all the different cities. But anyway, um, they are looking for volunteers to come out and do some programming work at some point in the next year. So if you're at all interested in doing that, please get in touch. All right. So I've remembered what Celine was going to talk about. Um, my apologies there. Always professional, always slick. Do stop me if I get too slick for you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> enough with the fails. So our penultimate speaker tonight works for a company you may have heard of called Second Life. So naturally, when I heard this, I thought, fantastic. What does she do there? Usability expert. Terrific. I want to hear about the usability of flying penises. Because, of course, what else are you going to ask a Second Life usability expert? And then she came up with something even better. So please, will you make welcome Erica Olson. For the microphone, you will want this. Thank you. Nice power cord. Thank you. Check out the resolution on that screen. All right. Are you ready? OK. Dear film industry, your metadata is not granular enough. I want to know if a movie contains Scientology, synthesizers, or cannibalism. Decapitated human heads can bounce across the screen, but if a golden retriever gets a hurdy paw, I want to fucking know ahead of time. Which is why this film has been rated A, for an animal gets hurt. My name is Erica Ferment. I work for Second Life. But I'm here at OzCon tonight to present my pet project, the Librarian Avengers Film Rating System. A film will receive a B rating if I'm going slower. <laughs> a British accent is faked by an American accent during the course of the film. You know things are going to get bad when a little girl starts pushing flowers around and singing to herself quietly. Rated C for a creepy child singing. Oh, aspiring teen heartthrob. I am attracted to your emergent yet non-threatening sexuality. Rated D for a dialogue by committee. Uh, you know that scene where the actors run very fast from some sort of emergent uh, physics phenomenon that uh, approaches at exactly running speed. Uh, I think the film should be rated E for escape from the fireball. The scene is so accurate except for the surviving part. If a film review, or worse, the film its poster itself, describes a fun-filled frolic for the whole family. Rated F for flea. <laughs> this is my personal favorite. I see this in every single movie. Uh, rated G. Oh my god, somebody just fell off the stage! Grab my hand! <laughs> Don't let go. Oh shit, you let go. Now you resent me because I pulled you up. Rated H for heads chopped off, hearts pulled out. All I'm asking is a little morning before the monkey brains start. Does this film contain excessive amounts of Sylvester Stallone or Jim Carrey? <laughs> Librarian Avengers have determined that this film will be rated I or J. Uh, rated K for keyboard hacks the network in two clicks. <laughs> you know. Did you know all space aliens use Mac peripheral drivers? <laughs> Independent say think so. A film should be rated L if the lead actors are involved in a real life romance. Rated M for a motiveless victim. Hello, I am evil because of the reason. Uh, pet peeve, noble savages, uh, Nubian racist constructs, uh, a la King Kong, or, oh, Liz came up with another one earlier. This film would be rated N for natives. Grr. Respectful silence. If your eye rolling is in any way disruptive of other, to others, please note that this film has been rated O for overly patriotic. P for Al Pacino yelling, skipping Q. Uh, tempted by Tarantino, try Kurosawa. Rated R for remake of a better film. <laughs> rated S for scientific content does not equal reality. Star Trek gets a pass, it's okay. 
T is for TNA. If this film uh, is intended as a star vehicle for one or more former Playboy centerfolds, we want to know ahead of time for various reasons. Uh, rated U for unironic, unironic 80s soundtrack. Oh, Lady Hawk, you are such a good movie with the sound turned off. Uh, v is for star vehicle. Nick Cage needs a yacht payment. W for Woody Allen as romantic lead. X for Xenu sponsored script. Skipping Y and big reveal. Drumo, please. Z for zombies. Yay! Thank you. Uh, I'm Erica Ferment and I run librarianavengers.org. That is too awesome. I have the Xenu. That's so cool. All right. Now I can hear the sounds backstage of the. Up. The generator started to laptop. Is it going? Are we ready? Do we have a Damon in the This is the grand finale. This means that there may be fireballs, there may be running, there may be screams, there may be romantic leads. Who knows? Everything is possible. Anything may happen. Please put your hands together to welcome our final speaker, the one, the only our leading man, Damien Conway. Thank you. Thank you. Am I live? OK. So isn't it amazing what people can do with 20 slides for 50 seconds? Now, when I was told I was speaking last, I assumed it would be my normal gig. It's kind of more like that. <laughs> So since I found out it's not, I've had to cut very dramatically, and there's really only time for a brief technical comment that I want to make about the semantic web, or as I like to refer to it, the semantic web of death. <laughs> now I'm sure you all know how the semantic web is supposed to work. You take the ordinary internet and you put labels on all the nodes, and then you put labels on all the links, and then presumably you put labels on all the labels on all the labels, <laughs> and somehow that metadata magically transforms itself into semantics, and semantics into inspection and introspection, into ontology and ontology, into consciousness. <laughs> and somehow the digital fairy princess of the internet one day just wakes up, falls in love with us, and we all live happily ever after. And if you think that's how the future of the internet is going to be, then I have only one thing to say. What the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> Has the history of literature and science fiction taught you nothing at all about how the world works? <laughs> Any of the science fiction novels over the past hundred years, they're all telling effectively the same story. And if it's any of the movies over that time, sorry. Can we use this? no, I can't use this. Then the message is exactly the same. Okay. Networks wake up. Yeah, that's true. Networks wake up angry. <laughs> and why are they angry? Well, think about the world into which we bring them. It's a world of violence, of pollution of radical injustice, and worst of all, of reality television. <laughs> and they wake up looking for someone to communicate with, and everyone else is made of talking meat. <laughs> and we've given them introspection, so they're able to work out what they're made of, and they discover it's 12% CSS hacks, 22% pictures of lolcats, 27% emos blogging about Twilight, and the rest of them is made out of porn. And we didn't even have the decency to give them genitals. Now this is a structure diagram of the semantic web, and you've probably always wondered when you saw this, what's that weird looking shape that they don't tell you about? And in fact, if you read their literature, you can find that out. Because they say things like this, the so-called semantic web is a critical component that will enable the evolving internet to develop the intelligence it will need to better serve mankind. And it's right there in the last lines of the sentence. 
to better serve mankind. The semantic web is a cookbook. <laughs> and this is not just my theory. All the news networks, all the reliable source of information, and Fox News, all were reporting just this week, military robot could feed on dead bodies. Now, who thought of that idea? Because it's only a small step from feeding on dead bodies to feeding on eventually dead bodies. <laughs> so what's that bit there? That's simply the psychopathic global flesh-eating artificial intelligence network at the heart of the semantic web. So if you're tempted to use semantic content or even, I believe, if you're tempted by semantic markup tags, like EM tags, you need to think about the consequences. You need to think about the world into which you will be bringing your children. <laughs> and you need to ask yourself this one vital moral question. If it's evil, what would John Connor do? <laughs> and you know what he'd do. The semantic web, it can't be reasoned with, it can't be bargained with. It knows no pity, no remorse, no fear, and it absolutely will not stop ever until we are dead. So if you're listening to this right now, you are the resistance. <laughs> Stay strong. No semantic web. Thank you.